Good evening, my name is Tom Broderick. I'm the Act and Chief Engineer for MassDOT, and I'm joined here tonight by Neil Boudreau, our State Traffic Engineer to my right, and with Charles Rennick from our legal department to my left. Arthur Greenberg from Battelle Memorial Institute, uh, the consultant who prepared the HAZMAT study, is also here to provide a very brief summary of the report and its findings in compliance with the federal ruling criteria. Some background on why we're here today. It's following a 2009 decision by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, the City of Boston was required to conduct a risk analysis subject to federal routing criteria evaluating alternative hazmat routes. The City of Boston engaged the services of the Patel Memorial Institute to perform that risk analysis, which examined a number of routes in consultation with MassDOT, which ultimately concluded that the existing route through the downtown area of Boston is significantly higher in risk than travel on the Beltway around Route 128. MassDOT conducted technical reviews of the report's risk assessment, and we requested additional information to ensure that proper procedures and consistent methodologies were employed to assess the risks, and these comments and responses are located on our website. In accordance with the federal regulatory process, we're here today to provide the public and interested parties with the opportunity to provide their comments and testimony on the proposed hazardous material routing designation that came about as a result of the risk analysis performed by the car. Uh, what is the proposed route designation? Uh, under the proposed route, hazmat vehicles would be prohibited from using the downtown area of the city of Boston for the through transportation of hazardous materials. Hazmat deliveries with the point of origin or destination in the downtown area would still be permitted provided the motor carrier required, uh, received the required permits. Route 128 would be designated as the preferred through route over which hazardous, uh, hazardous materials approaching the city would be transported. What the law says is under the federal law, MassDOT is the state agency with the governing responsibility for ensuring that all hazmat routing designations comply with the federal routing standards. MassDOT must re resolve all conflicts among hazardous materials routes and approve all hazardous materials routing designations under these federal regulations. Federal routing standards include, among others, population, density, type of highway, type of hazardous material, emergency response capabilities, consultation with affected parties, proximity to schools, hospitals, playgrounds, and other sensitive areas, terrain considerations, continuity of routes, alternative routes, effects on commerce, delays in transportation, climatic considerations, and congestion and accident history. There are a lot of folks here today, so I'd like to remind everyone to try and keep their comments brief so that everybody that wishes to speak can participate. Uh, copies of the report, the federal routing standards, and frequently answered questions and other relevant information are available through the MassDOT website. If you have any questions, please submit them to us tonight through the comment sheets available at the sign-in desk, and we'll respond accordingly. The format for tonight's hearing will be for MassDOT to solicit testimony. Responses to comments will be grouped by topic and responded to through our website. There are a number of frequently asked questions already displayed on the website, and we'll be adding to that list as the hearings progress. And this is so that we can be consistent in our responses, make sure that all the right information is getting out, and that we do expect that there'll be a duplicate of information and duplicate, a uh, good deal of duplicate comments that are received, so we want to respond to them as quickly as we can. After receipt of all comments and an analysis of any new routing information presented for review relative to the risk assessment that may offer the initial determination, MassDOT will inform the federal motor carriers of the final preferred routing. Thank you again for being here to present testimony this evening. This public hearing, the first of four, is an important part of the public process. Uh, we need to review the process, the proposed routing designation, and I look forward to hearing your testimony. At this time, I'd like to ask Art Greenberg from the Tell Institute to come up and make a few remarks regarding the hazmat evaluation that was undertaken by that firm. Well, I'd like Just will ensure he doesn't speak too long because I can't stand up that long. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. So we, I think the, uh, the the main focus of what I'm about to say is is to discuss the process 
that the tell followed to complete this analysis. And we've already had some of the introduction, and when we we know that uh, that Patel was hired by the city to conduct the analysis, and that we also know that Patel was following the federal standards, the federal regulations when we conducted our analysis. One of the things that wasn't mentioned is that we also that they're also included in the in the federal under the federal regulations are guidelines which tell you how to assess a hazardous material route to look at the risk. And we follow those guidelines. They're actually DOT, Department of Transportation guidelines, which are called guidelines for applying criteria to designate routes for transportation of hazardous materials. And so we followed those guidelines and so we we weren't just creating a methodology. We, the methodology which we were required to follow. And we did look at those 13 factors that were mentioned, such as population density and emergency response, and so forth, and we, we sought to obtain the best kind of quantitative data that we could. So we, we, we went after, and, and some, as some of you know, we tried to get the best data available. The, well, one of the fortunate things in this process was that we had excellent cooperation from, from a number of agencies, including, as we know, Mass DOT, State Police, the Mass GIS, Geographic Information System, the CTPS, which is a, a planning staff, and the various agencies in the city, including the Fire Department, Police Department, Transportation Department, and others. <coughs> and we also, consulted with the UMass SAFE people, which is an interdisciplinary program at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and they work on transportation safety, and so we were referred to them by, the, by UMass and state police, <coughs> and, they, and they work to, to create accident rates for us. So, in addition, in order to select the alternative routes, we, we also had considerable cooperation from some organizations, groups, for example, North End Waterfront Hazmat Task Force, the Massachusetts Motor Transportation Association, and, and really many, as I've indicated, many government agencies. The key data that we needed to conduct the risk assessment included truck accident rates, that was key, population within a half mile on the <coughs> side of the route, and we also had to know the types of current hazmat truck <coughs> cargo. The accident rates, as I indicated, were developed for us by UMass SAFE or the University of Massachusetts, and they, they have the data for that, the accident data for serious cra truck crashes and tell, we, we supplied them with truck flows, truck movements, so they could give us the, uh, the accident rates. And they gave us accident rates by road functional class for urbanized areas. And then for population, in order to get the population on either side of the routes, we, <coughs> we actually looked at, the, we got a lot of our data came from the census, residential, and employment, and then we estimated populations for hotels, hospitals, nursing homes, schools, and we even looked at the visitors, for especially from the from the National Park Service, which is one of the focus <coughs> points for tourists. And even after the report was completed, we we also had the uh, an answer to a question from from Mass DOT, we looked at visitors or shoppers at shopping centers. To, uh, to get the type of hazardous material, we looked at diverse sources, including hazardous material spill data, so you can get some idea of what kind of material is moving through by what sort of accidents or incidents you have. We had uh, police department inspection records, we actually we sent out something like 1,200 questionnaires, primarily to hazmat carriers in Boston and vicinity, and the U.S. Bureau of Hazard, of U.S. Bureau of Census 
hazardous material commodity flow survey did a special run for us for the Boston region. And what we conclude is probably what most of you know, the greatest quantity of hazardous materials is the or are the flammable liquids, or, or as some of you know, it's class three, such things as gasoline. And that's more than 90% of the shipments. So the, the routing analysis really then looked at the relative risk to the public of transporting hazardous materials. And so we, we ended up, we, we finally we used a formula, which was risk equals accident rates times number of people adjacent to the routes. And this was, this was a formula that is specified in the, in the uh, federal guidelines itself. The through routing risk criteria tell us that if a, when you're looking at comparing routes, if one has 50% more risk than another, then you could choose the one with the less risk. In other words, if, if one risk is one and a half times the risk of another risk, and you, you can actually select the ones with less risk. When we, we looked at, uh, when we compared the risk for the major routes we were examining, and there's, a, there's kind of a map on the, map on the, on the stand there, we basically looked at one route which was from Everett to Quincy going through Boston and compared that with another route going around Boston on 128. And we found that during the day, we looked at it for day, so we separated population out for day and night. During the day, it was approximately four times the risk for going through Boston as going around. <coughs> And at night, it wasn't, the difference wasn't as much. It was a little bit over two times the risk of going through Boston as going around. We also, in addition to this risk to the population, we also looked at emergency response capabilities, the environment, burden of commerce. We, we judged emergency response to be adequate to handle a hazmat incident. So every place we looked, all the routes we looked at, there, there was a reasonable emergency response infrastructure in place. <clears throat> the environmental risk, although important, was also judged, and we looked at that as well, it was judged to be secondary. And we also, we also looked at the <coughs> commerce and found that, to be, found that to be reasonable if that 128 route was selected as opposed to going through, through the city. So, Really, got to just sum that up. The factors besides the risk, such as emergency response capabilities, location of sensitive environmental features, climate, burden of commerce, those factors, although important, did not trump, did not overcome the risk to the population. So, based on our analysis, we, we really felt there was, in the, in the analysis, that there really was really ample justification to restrict daytime through hazmat shipments in downtown Boston because, as, as we said, there was much greater risk when going through Boston as opposed to going around. And at night, there is also, there's, it's not as great, but there's, there's, <coughs> there is justification for restricting through nighttime traffic because there is a, a ratio of, of over two, and there's two times the risk of going through. And as indicated earlier, there was really nothing, nothing in our analysis to say that local shipments of hazardous material, say deliveries you know, within the city of Boston, there was, no, there was nothing in our analysis that said that that traffic should be restricted. <coughs> and nothing, nothing to say that it should be restricted beyond the restrictions currently in place under the uh, permit system. So that's a very quick, quick summary. Thank you, Ed. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Commissioner Thomas Tinley from the Boston Transportation Department uh, to speak on behalf of the city of Boston as the, the uh, agency that commissioned the study. I don't get a chair. <laughs> You're younger than I am. <laughs> 
And don't be alarmed by the number of pages in my remarks, but the words are very big so that I can, I can read them. Uh, good evening. My name is Thomas Tinlin. I'm Commissioner of the Boston Transportation Department. And I'm here tonight to provide testimony on behalf of Boston Mayor Thomas M. Menino. This testimony will lay out the City of Boston's public safety decision to seek and propose an alternative highway route for the transportation of hazardous materials to bypass the downtown and North End neighborhood portion of the City of Boston. When the City of Boston, when either the drop-off or pick-up location for the cargo is located in the city. We all remember the events of 9-11, how they horrified and shocked the world. At that time, governments around the globe began a determined effort to ensure the safest environment possible for all who live, work, and visit their cities. As a massive undertaking began to hide in targets of opportunity against terrorist attacks, simultaneously, an equally important effort was underway to identify and mitigate everyday hazards to our city that also pose a very real risk of life property, and economic vitality. The City of Boston participated in the self-review, along with almost every major city in the country. One issue that stood out immediately was the transport of hazardous materials through the City of Boston. With hazmat cargo trucks using downtown and neighborhood streets as shortcuts for the sake of profit and convenience for the trucking industry. The completion of the Central Artery Tunnel Project and the depression of the elevated John Fitzgerald Expressway in the I-93 corridor in downtown Boston, which previously served as the designated hazardous materials route, transformed this roadway into a tunnel from which hazardous materials are excluded. As a result, those hazardous material trucks that were once confined to the interstate highway system were now rerouted to surface streets in downtown Boston neighborhoods. Bringing these hazmat cargoes into much closer proximity to the general population on and adjacent to these public ways. For many years, the Boston Fire Department, under city regulations established in 1980, had regulated the transportation of certain quantities of hazardous materials on our roadways, and had issued, issued which, what was known as cut-through permits to the trucking industry, allowing them through access on city streets where there was neither a point of origin nor destination. It's important to remember that these permits were granted by the city purely as a convenience measure for the trucking industry, not as a right. In point of fact, the permits were granted by the fire commissioner for the purpose of authorizing these motor carriers to operate on city streets, an exception to the otherwise <coughs> applicable restrictions contained in the city's regulations, but only where a compelling need was shown by a company in where transporting of hazardous materials was found to be in the public interest. It became clear that if these carriers were not dropping off or picking up cargo in Boston, the risk of having them on our streets in the densely populated downtown neighborhoods was too great. We welcome and continue to welcome local deliveries by trucks carrying hazardous materials necessary for the daily operation of the multitude of public and private buildings located within Boston. However, continuing to accept the extra burden from cut-through vehicles with no business purpose, purpose for being in the city other than operating convenience presented an unreasonable risk to the general public when safer routing alternatives are readily available. To provide the industry with an opportunity to present its case on this issue, in 2006 we held individual hearings with all hazardous material carriers that had previously been issued cut-through permits for the downtown Boston area. It should be noted that the city ordinance authorizing the regulations that allowed these permits to be issued where the motor carrier wished to operate their vehicles in a manner inconsistent with the otherwise applicable restrictions contained in the regulations clearly states that economic criteria shall not, not should not, but shall not, be a determinative of whether or not an alternative route outside of the city is practical. Similar federal regulations state that operating convenience of the motor carrier is not a basis for determining whether such an alternative route is practical. At these hearings, companies testified before a committee made up of representatives from Boston's transportation, police, and fire departments that if they were prohibited from cutting through the city, their trips would be longer and more expensive. This translates into operating convenience and economic factors. The, two, the very two criteria that the city permitting process 
clearly states that the fire commissioner shall not consider when deciding whether or not to issue a permit. While still focused on enhancing public safety, the City of Boston wanted to be as helpful to this important industry as possible. Therefore, rather than applying the City's 1980 regulations strictly impo and strictly imposing a 24-7 day a week ban on the use of city streets, we opted in 2006 to implement a daytime ban. This would prohibit the transport of hazardous materials through the city during the period when our population almost doubles due to commuters, tourists, students, and others. At the same time, it would allow the through movement of hazardous materials between the hours of 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. to continue. Although this provided the industry with 10 hours each day to cut through downtown Boston, the decision did not sit well with some folks who are in the room tonight. Nevertheless, in a good faith attempt to balance the public safety needs of the city with the demands of the industry, the change went into effect on July 3rd, 2006, and lasted for about four years, with no complaint from the Commonwealth, the federal government, elected officials, or surrounding communities. At the same time, to increase public safety in connection with the transportation of hazardous materials within the city, the city determined that it was in the public interest and prudent to adjust the local hazmat route shifting hazmat traffic from the temporary route during central artery construction along Commercial Street to the newly improved surface, surface roadway in Cross Street Car, which, as the result of the central artery project, now encompass better sight distance, geometry, signalization, and lighting. It was also shorter and a more direct route than the Commercial Street segment it replaced. In disagreement with these two changes, the American Trucking Association and the then Mass Highway Department requested and was granted a preemption determination from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The preemption decision was issued on November 16, 2009, and following a request for an extension became effective on July 1, 2010. The decision, the federal government indicated that it did not necessarily disagree with the routing decisions that had been made, but determined that the City of Boston had not followed the proper process under federal regulation before implementing the program. The rationale was that the City's actions, modifying its past permitting practice and downtown route were taken without the required study and consultative process and had created a de facto new route designation. We were surprised by, we were surprised by this, as the City did not intend to designate an entirely new route but to simply enforce a long-standing local regulation which allowed us to control the hours that these vehicles were allowed to travel on the route which now had been realigned to take advantage of the improved surface roads within the same transportation car. In any event, the federal government had made its ruling and the city was left with only two options. One, allow trucks carrying hazardous materials to cut through the city every day of the week, both day and night, or two, go through this process as laid out by the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. The city chose the latter course of action. <coughs> to comply with the request, the city engaged the Battelle Memorial Institute, a 501c3 charitable trust headquartered in Columbus, Ohio, that you heard from tonight. Battelle is an internationally respected consulting firm that specializes in hazardous materials transportation analysis, risk assessment, and policy support. The findings of this federally mandated study were eye-opening. As I said earlier, our plan was simply to prohibit hazardous materials from cutting through the city during the day. This study, however, demanded by the industry, concluded that the movement of hazardous material trucks through the city of Boston using the current downtown routing presents significantly more risk to the general public during both the day, day and the night. <coughs> than available alternative routes to bypass the densely populated downtown area of Boston. In fact, the relative difference in risk to the public between the routes was so compelling, both day and night, that under the established federal through routing criteria, the length of the deviation on the proposed alternative route did not have to be taken into account. The proposed bypass route is that much safer. Faced with conclusive evidence of unacceptable risk, the city now had no choice but to pursue a nighttime restriction on hazmat transportation as well. The city of Boston has carefully and meticulously completed what the federal and state government, as well as the industry, demanded of us. It was a long and arduous process, but the city of Boston got the job done. 
As the agency responsible for designating hazardous cargo routes, it is now time for the Massachusetts Department of Transportation to complete its job. The Commonwealth has invested literally billions upon billions of dollars on our interstate roadway system, including the ongoing widening of Route 128, which is designed to promote and enhance interstate and intrastate commerce and enhance highway transportation safety. <laughs> the regional through transportation of hazardous material falls into this category. This <coughs> industry should, should be on that interstate roadway, pure and simple, and not on routes that go through or near heavily populated area, places where crowds are assembled in crowded urban streets, especially where alternative highway routes are demonstrated to be safer and present significantly lower risk to the general public. To allow this practice to continue with this overwhelming evidence would be reckless and ill-advised. The industry demanded this process, but now that they don't like the results, they want to do over. The industry will tell you it will cost them too much in time and money, when in fact, we are talking about an estimated 22 minutes of increased travel time in each direction. Imagine 22 minutes of travel is opposed to thousands of lives unnecessarily put at increased risk. They'll tell you it's too expensive. Yet Patel's report <laughs> estimate the cost will be less than one cent per gallon of product. Less than a penny, as opposed to putting thousands of lives at risk on a daily basis. <coughs> the industry will tell you that Boston is better equipped in the event of a disaster. This is probably the most insulting argument to date. When you cannot make your case based on fact, make it through fear. Industry figures show that an incident involving hazmat transportation occurs on average once for every one million vehicle miles traveled. Despite this data, a single crash of a truck transporting hazmat in a crowded area has the potential for deaths and injuries far beyond that of a truck carrying non-hazmat non cargo, which is why we're here. Recognizing the potential for several hazardous materials incidents underscores the need for designating appropriate routes for the transportation of hazardous materials which is a key strategy for increasing and ensuring public safety. An incident on Route 128 is no doubt a disaster, but the same incident in the heart of downtown Boston is nothing short of a catastrophe that will exacerbate exposures and have far-reaching effects on life, property, and the very economic vitality of our region. Also, as you all know, Boston provides more emergency response local aid than any other city or town in the Commonwealth. That will not change. In 2009, we were on scene at the tanker accident in Brown Circle and Revere, and it's August last month. So the argument that Boston is better equipped to handle an event is insulting on too many levels to get into here. It's unfortunate that some would attempt to make this an issue of Boston versus its outlying communities and our suburban neighbors, when nothing could be further from the truth. The primary criterion for routing designation is that the designated, excuse me, the des designated route significantly reduces public risk. The federal standards for the highway routing hazardous materials place central importance upon enhancing public safety. The federal routing designation <coughs> process we engage in is, expressive, is expressly designed to identify and evaluate roadway and community characteristics that make one route preferable to another. From, this perspective of, from the perspective of improving the overall public safety associated with the transportation of hazardous materials. Interstate routes that avoid populated areas minimize these risks because, because of their better safety records. It's really a matter of minimizing unnecessary risk to the greatest number of potentially exposed people in the areas most likely to experience an accident involving a hazardous materials release. In closing, Mayor Menino would like to thank MassDOT for holding these public hearings and for working so closely with us on this issue. The Mayor would also like to thank our elected leaders, Senators Kerry and Brown, Congressman Capuano and Lynch and the entire Boston delegation at the State House led by Representative Aaron Michaelitz, as well as our local partner City Councilor Salamantina, and all the concerned residents and business people of our city who are tirelessly focused on this danger. The City of Boston's public safety team has been fully engaged on this issue for many years as they strive to keep Boston and our region safe every day. If their subject matter expertise is needed, representatives from Boston's police and fire departments, as well as our Homeland Security Office, are in attendance tonight and will respond to any and all questions and concerns after these hearings are concluded. Again, thank you, and we look forward to hearing the testimony provided by others who are here this evening. Thank you very much.
As you were coming in, we, we had a, a comment sheet and a notice of public hearings. If everybody didn't get one, we still have more available that you can pick up uh, later on on your way out if you didn't get them on the way in. Uh, we will be accepting all comments. The, the written comments will be accepted until close of business on September 23rd, 2011. Uh, and all, all comments that are postmarked by September 23rd, 2011, uh, provided their postmark will be received 10 business days. It will be accepted 10 business days after the close of the comment period. So if you don't, have, if you don't feel like submitting comments tonight and you'd like to take some time to think about it, as long as you get get them postmarked within 10 business days of September 23rd, those will be accepted and part of the public record. I'd like to lay down the, the ground rules for tonight's hearing. Uh, all speakers must sign in on the speakers list in order to provide testimony. Uh, we tried to grab that, as many people as we could on the way in to make them aware. If you haven't, uh, you can still sign up over here, over this side of the room. Uh, speakers must speak into the microphone and provide their name, home address, and affiliated organization if applicable. Comments should be uh, directed to the hearing body. They should be relevant to the topic, and they should not be personal in nature. Uh, testimony should be kept to three minutes or less to provide everyone with an opportunity to speak. Please avoid repetitive comments. If your comment was answered during the introductory remarks, we request that you uh, defer in, in the interest of time. And at the MassDOT hearing procedures, we'll open up with any comments for federal elected officials followed by state elected officials, and then we'll open up the comments uh, to people in order that they signed in on the sign-in sheets. I'd also like to take this moment to introduce Secretary Jeffrey Mullen, who's also here tonight to listen to the comments on this hearing. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Donnie Daly, who will be making the uh, make sure everybody has the opportunity to speak who signed up and he'll he'll MC the, the comment period. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, to reiterate what uh, Tom said, we do have three elected officials here that uh, I will call uh, at this moment to speak on behalf of their constituents prior to calling the list. Um, if, in fact, you haven't signed up um, to speak, you can just come up here. Like the page is right here, folks. and. Uh, and you can sign up and we'll take you in that order. Um, a colleague of mine, John Romano, who's sitting next to the microphone, raise your hand, John. He'll give you a reminder at the 30 second, uh, with 30 seconds to go, if in fact you do know that long. So, and right now I'd like to call up our State Representative Aaron Michaelwitz of Boston. Okay, the four State Representative Aaron Michaelwitz, State Senator Anthony Petrocelli, and Boston City Councilor Sala Martino. Feel that, man. So, uh, first, I want to say I want to thank Secretary Mullen for his attention to this matter, and uh, I look forward to engaging uh, Mr. Rich Davey in the, in the coming months on this issue. I want to thank you for uh, allowing us to speak out of turn. I know there's a lot of, uh, of our constituents here today and a lot of uh, interested parties, and uh, I want to thank uh, the opportunity to, to go first, so thank you. Uh, we sit here, we stand here today asking for the Department of Transportation to support the findings of the City of Boston Hazmat Route Evaluation Report that Patel completed in April early this year. Many people outside the North End Waterfront believe once that the Central Artery came down and the Greenway was built, that the uh, issues of the Big Dig were officially over. But we in the North End and Waterfront know that that is uh, certainly not the case. Undeveloped parcels, unfulfilled promises of, of a new community center and supermarket, and most visibly, Hazmat trucks barreling down Cross Street, North Washington Street, and Commercial Street leave much work to be done. For nearly 10 years now, we have watched trucks, trucking routes change from one to another at a confusing rate. The Federal Motor Carriers Administration's request of the City of Boston to complete a thorough study was much needed as it gave us all an opportunity to obtain facts and figures to go along with a lot of the rhetoric that had been talked about over the past decade. Through Battelle, the City has, just, has done just that. In inspecting 18 different potential routes from both north and southbound, Patel's study took into account a number of important variables when determining which route is the safest. By using the 2008 census data, the study properly evaluated population density, school population, hotel population, 
hospitals, nursing home, tourist population, and most importantly, the potential impact areas along each of these proposed routes. The numbers speak for themselves. The routes through downtown Boston are significantly more dangerous than those that travel outside the city and specifically along, along I-95. Unless doing business in the city limits, hazardous cargo does not belong in the North End waterfront area and hazardous cargo does not belong in the city of Boston. We all know about the recent tragedy along Route 1 earlier this summer and no one likes to use an incident such as that to make a, to make a point. But imagine if such an accident had taken place on the dense populated streets of Boston. I've heard, recent arguments, I've, I've heard recently the arguments that, that making these routes longer could potentially lead to higher prices for the consumer at the gas pump. That is a debate I look forward to engaging in. Putting a price tag on the safety and well-being of the residents of Boston and the residents of the North End and Waterfront is both reckless and short-sighted. I've also had significant doubts on how much an, of an increase in overhead cost a route change would actually have. Lastly, I want to thank the Mayor for his diligence on this issue, and especially the Boston Transportation Department and their Commissioner Tom Tinlin, not just for his, test, for his strong testimony today, but for his tireless work on getting us to this point today. I'm going to turn it over to my, my colleague, Senator Anthony Petrosani. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, um, Commissioner Tinlin really did a wonderful job uh, talking about the particulars of uh, why a lot of people in this room, if not all of them, support the proposal uh, for the redirected hazmat route. Uh, so I'll just briefly touch on when I, when I look at that map, a little bit of the challenges ahead for not necessarily you, Mr. Secretary, but the incoming Secretary, as you think about the decisions you have to make. Uh, you're going to be going to other communities to hear uh, over the coming days and weeks. Uh, and as I looked at that map, I grow a little concerned that uh, we're outnumbered. Uh, there are more communities that are going to have uh, an opposition to this for one reason of an, or another. Uh, and I speak from some experience as Sal does as well with some of the airport battles that we had in the past. And uh, Tommy mentioned he doesn't want to make it a, an us versus them uh, issue. Uh, but I have a fear that sometimes these issues become that. And I want to avoid that because uh, look at those numbers, we can't win. Uh, but if you look at uh, the reality, if you look at the report that was done and the fact, the fact is on our side. Uh, and I don't blame, I have good friends and colleagues uh, that will testify, I'm sure, in Quincy and in Waltham and in Stoneham over the coming days. Uh, and I respect what they have to do and I respect people who live in these outlying communities uh, that they don't want trucks coming on the highway, uh, but that's where they belong. If trucks are too dangerous to be coming through the tunnels, they're too dangerous to be coming through the community of the North End in Boston. Uh, and I just ask you to please consider that uh, in mind as you go through the coming weeks, uh, because I won't be surprised if these rooms are filled like this uh, in those other places asking you to oppose uh, it. But you should not do that. The fact is on our side, and I urge your consideration for the proposal. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, just for the record, I did send a letter in regards to my concerns. I do have two pages here, but uh, the Senator and the Representative expressed their, my concerns as well as the people that we represent. Um, Commissioner Tenlin, thank you for your remarks on behalf of the Mayor. You know, um, I've been working in the city of Boston, particularly with Moth End, for since 1987. And when we were going through the Central Highway Project um, in, the, in my neighborhood in North End, that was one of our concerns in the early 1990s about the hazmat rules once the, the tunnel was completed. Um, I'm here because this concern is, uh, is a quality of life. The, the people that live in my district, every night they go to bed fear that um, that they may wake up with a disaster that just happened in Saugus and, and, and what happened to Edward. And we were talking about these truck routes. Um, this is the front yard. This is our local streets. And I challenge you here today to sit at the Rose County Greenway any night and just watch those trucks as well zooming by. 
particularly at night. Uh, I challenge you to sit in Joanne um, Franchise's house on North Washington Street and how her kitchen shakes when these trucks go by. So this is a, a serious concern for the people that uh, live in the North End in Charlestown. Um, these trucks do not belong on our local streets. And God forbid, God forbid if there was ever an accident like I just mentioned in Revere or in Saugus, um, many, many people will probably lose their lives. So I, I, I thank you for being here tonight. I ask that you listen to the concerns of the people uh, that live in my district, because this is a very big concern. It's a quality of life issue for those people. Thank you. The next speaker will be Ann Lynch from the Massachusetts Motor Transportation Association. Good evening. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity. My name is Ann Lynch from Mass Motor Transportation Association. I serve as the executive director there and our address is 10 Liberty Square in Boston. Well, we've been for 11 years, so uh, we too are Boston residents. Thank you very much, Chairman Broderick, for this meeting, and certainly to Secretary Mullen for attending to hear our points. We have never felt that the issue of a truck route was about convenience. We have always felt that the issue of a truck route is about safety, public safety, trucker safety, and efficient delivery of essential commodities to the citizens of Massachusetts. As noted by um, Chairman Broderick tonight, the primary loads that are being carried by trucks are gasoline, diesel fuel, and home heating oil, all of them essential to all the citizens of Massachusetts. The association represents trucking of all forms throughout the state. We are a statewide organization, the only one that represents commercial transportation here. And we deliver to your homes and your businesses 94.8% of all goods in Massachusetts are delivered by truck of the four modalities, rail, air, sea, and truck in Massachusetts, we deliver just under 95% of everything to our citizens. So we take very seriously the issue of bringing all that you need from your bananas to your heating oil, from your baby diapers to anything else that you see or touch to your homes and businesses in mass. 84% more miles have been added to truck delivery over the last 20 years. During that time, a 41% reduction of truck accidents has occurred. These stats are easily available from Federal Highway and others who have conducted these kinds of studies. The very simple matter is less time, less distance on the road creates greater public safety. And the proposal here tonight would take a route, and that route would be from Boston to Braintree, that is currently nine miles long, and turn it into a 53 to 57 mile one-way route. That is significantly more that is significantly more time than we would normally uh, have. And I, I'll tell you, if you can get down 128 in 20 minutes, I'm following you because I've done it a thousand times and we've never been able to do that. Um, our concern for trucker safety, 80% of accidents involving trucks, according to a recent study by AAA, American Automobile Association, are caused by accident by cops. So our concern is for trucker safety because when those accidents occur, the most likely person to die in that accident, as we've seen in recent accidents, is the truck driver. Even when caused by the Honda cutting them off, the truck driver is the person who dies. So trucker safety for us is absolutely tantamount to the things that we need to do. Tonight we're announcing that we've hired a nationally renowned independent research firm to review the Battelle study come up with our concerns about going in environmentally sensitive areas around 128, around drinking water supplies, around a road that has been recently deemed to have 130% of capacity. At, we are uh, fraught with high speeds on highways when it's not congested, and we have an average of about 8 to 10 miles an hour with traffic lights every block 
going through the city. It is virtually impossible to roll a truck over at eight to 10 miles an hour. So trucker safety is also a big part of what we do. We too thank the MassDOT folks, the city of Boston for going through the steps necessary to make an accurate and uh, qualified study. We do have exceptions with some of the issues raised by the Patel report. We will include our expert report as part of our written testimony prior to the deadline. And we are deeply concerned that we are dedicated to providing safe, efficient transportation of essential commodities to all of you folks. We look forward to working with you and thank you very much. The next speaker is Deb Baronski of the Massachusetts Chamber of Business and Industry. Gentlemen, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to um, testify this evening. And uh, for the record, my name is Deborah Baronski. I am the president of the Massachusetts Chamber. And I am here representing um, my members, of which there are over 900 from throughout the Commonwealth, in opposition of the city's proposed hazardous material truck route. The Massachusetts Chamber is your state chamber. We are um, missioned to, to advocate, inform, and educate um, our members with regard to issues that can affect their ability to do business in the Commonwealth. Our business members are from throughout the Commonwealth, from the Berkshires all the way here to Boston. And um, we are very concerned about what's going to take place with this proposed change. We have an office here in Boston at 60 State Street, and we also have an office in Western Mass. We have three primary concerns with this. First is the uh, potential increased cost to business. Diverting the truck route means more miles, which means more diesel fuel, which means more and longer trips. The hazmat carriers will undoubtedly have to increase their costs, and guess who's going to pay? you're going to pay because the business people are going to have to increase their costs. We know that the business community is, is the, the crux for all job creation and growth throughout the Commonwealth. They cannot afford any increases whatsoever. Our second concern is with regard to delays in service and congestion. Trucks will be using Route 128, already heavily trafficked, during bad weather, with 24-7 traffic, it could be days before businesses and residents receive important business, uh, in receipt of heating oil and other services needed. Our businesses also are concerned because their employees use Route 128 to get to their companies. This congestion will automatically continue to uh, cause slow down and congestion for businesses when trying to get their employees to work. I'd finally like to say that Massachusetts does not need to add any more taxes or concerns on the business person, nor do we need to give them more reason for considering alternative places to do business. We have many challenges keeping our businesses here in Massachusetts. We do not need to burden them further and I would like to uh, thank you for listening to my comments and would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. The next speaker is John Hamill from JNS Transport. Well, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to Boston's proposed ban on true traffic hazardous materials. My name is John Hamill. My wife Sharon and I own JNS Transport Company, located at 12 Washington Street in Lynn. We operate a fleet of tank transports, employing 20 drivers. Our primary commodity is gasoline, diesel fuel, and heating oil. We operate around the clock. A little of my experience, I personally drove in and out of Boston and around Group 128 for 25 years of my life. Uh, we have been in business since 1992. So topics of discussion here are how do we get from point A, the loading terminals in Everett, Revere, and Chelsea, to point B, point south of the city. Uh, federal regulations say for through routing 397.71 were developed to ensure the continuity of movement as not to impede or unnecessarily delay the transportation of non-radioactive hazardous materials. <coughs> this proposed ban affects all of those. 
it affects the continuity, it impedes the deliveries, and certainly delays the transportation of non-radioactive acid materials. So the benefits of the Boston route, it is a very direct route. What we're talking about here is 1.5 miles, and that is according to GPS, which is equipped in each and every one of our trucks. 1.5 miles to rejoin Interstate 93 south of Neyland Street at an average speed of 8 to 15 miles per hour with control signals, stoplights, uh, traffic controls. It's a very slow speed route and the risk of an accident taking place, a major accident, is very slim. Uh, reduced exposure. We all know that the less time traveling on the road, the less chance there is for a serious accident. Now, to my knowledge, and that is 25 years of driving through the city of Boston and around Route 128, I am unaware and would like anyone to be able to let me know, to tell me of a major accident or major spill involving a gasoline or heating oil truck on the proposed hazmat roof. I am unaware of any. <clears throat> Excuse me. Response time by emergency personnel. Boston is the primary responder to an incident of this nature. Boston did respond to the tanker rollover in Saugus, and if there was a, a major accident along 128, the local fire departments could perhaps contain the incident and wait for Boston to show up for with the phone, the proper phone. Uh, the downside to Route 128, the delays in shipment, 53 miles. Now, 53 miles traveled in the winter time in the snow. As a driver, I dread that trip each and every time. Now, 53 miles each way is actually is unacceptable in putting the lives of our drivers and the general public around them in harm's way. Communities not prepared. Once again, I, we, we met with fire, fire chiefs from various communities in, in 2008, and they informed us that they were not prepared, nor did they know they had the extra traffic coming from Boston. Uh, road designs, studies have shown that Route 128 operates at 130% capacity. If we add more tanker trucks to that already stretched roadway, it's a recipe for disaster. Natural resources, if a tanker truck was to roll over and, water, and the product was to go into three drinking sources, the city of Cambridge, the city of Boston, and others would be affected and have no drinking water for quite a period of time, I'm sure. Uh, hours of service. Drivers, commercial drivers, are only allowed to drive so many hours according to federal regulations. If we have to pull our drivers off the road and they cannot complete their trips, we're going to need more trucks to accomplish the same amount of work. So now we're perhaps doubling the trucks onto 128 that's already at capacity. So with that, I will, I will wrap it up. And I would like to thank Massioti for allowing me to speak here this evening and respectfully ask that you do not approve Boston's hazardous material in route. And if anyone has any questions, I would be more than happy to engage them. Thank you. And I remind people we want to keep the remarks to three minutes or less. Um, there are a lot of people who want to speak. And Donnie, maybe we can call up like three speakers at a time to save a few times some time to come get Okay, here. the next three speakers are Larry Noonan from JP Noonan, Monica Tibbetts from the 128 Business Council, and Brendan O'Brien is listed as a resident. Uh, if those three folks can step in the microphone, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition to the City of Boston proposal to export the risk of hazmat tra transport to 23 communities along the 128, banning through traffic of hazardous materials. My name is Larry Noonan. I'm here today representing J.P. Moore Transportation, a safe, federally, state, and locally regulated transport of hazardous materials and other needed commodities throughout the, the we're located in West Bridgewater, Mass. We've been transporting hazardous materials through Boston for just under 50 years now. The company was started by my brother Peter. It's a family-run operation in 1962. Uh, we've had uh, good luck transporting hazmat through the city. 
uh, without incident. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to testify this evening. Uh, it's a very serious issue. It's not as much a, a matter of economics for business as it is safety. We're concerned for those of us around us on the highway. And as John just stated, the travel through the, the short distance in downtown Boston is so much slower than 128 traffic and so much safer because of that and because of the stoplights. Our drivers are uh, federally approved. They're CDL drivers with hazmat training and they're also uh, in, to us with a tanker uh, license so that the, the training they receive is much more specific than the training that a typical truck driver might experience. Because of that, our safety record speaks for itself. Uh, I won't go into the, the extent of the routes, uh, the extra miles traveled with a lot of speakers here tonight, but I will just say a typical route from Boston to Brockton straight through is 24 miles, around up 93 to Woburn, around 128 is 63 miles. On a round trip basis, that's 126 miles compared to 48 as a direct travel. We seriously questioned the Vattel study with the time involved in making that extra travel, especially in the winter time. On a road to Cohasset, 26 miles direct, 73 miles around Boston. That's 146 miles compared to 52. If you look at Plymouth, we can go from the terminals to Plymouth direct in 40 miles. Around 128, 87 miles, totaling 174 going around to 80 straight through. Which, which of the two routes is safer? And that's our major concern. It's not, it's not the economics, it's just from point A to point B, it's the shortest distance is the safest. Thank you for the chance to testify this evening. I appreciate it, and if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Martha Tibbetts from the 128 Business Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in opposition of the ban this evening. My name is Monica Tibbetts, and I'm the Executive Director of the 128 Business Council. The 128 Business Council is a nonprofit public transit provider working within the 128 corridor. We have been providing shuttle connections to MBTA hubs for employees of the 128 corridor for over 27 years. Last year alone, we were responsible for over 500,000 trips on the Route 128. We use, this, we use the route the City of Boston is proposing every single day. The capacity on this road rate is already at 130%, greatly impacting the flow of traffic on 128. We are already dealing with congestion that brings daily commutes to a standstill. We cannot handle any more traffic on our already overtaxed roadway. We are asking that MassDOT not pursue this new route designation as it will continue to disable a roadway that is already failing. As one of the previous speakers spoke about, um, this past winter was one of the worst winters that we've ever seen on Route 128. For the first time in 27 years, we had to close down our operations, which means that 50 to 60 companies could not get any of their employees in. That is how bad 128 has become, and it's gonna be even worse as we go forward. Even in the summer when traditionally we see traffic drop off, we've actually seen it increase. So I can only imagine what it's gonna look like going into this fall with all of the new students back in school, and especially going into this winter that is promising to be just as bad as last winter, if not worse. So I urge you to please, please reconsider this, and if anybody has any questions, please see me after the hearing, and thank you again. My name is Brendan O'Brien. I'm a resident of Boston's North End. Um, I don't know if I can say much more than what Mr. Timlin said in his final discussion as well as the Patel study. But I do want to make a few points, and that is one, I fully support Boston's proposed routing designation, and I request that Mass DOT also support the designation. Now, I've heard a lot of numbers here today and statistics, and while they're all fact based, and you know, it's hard to argue with that. I think it's important to keep other things in mind. And one is that <clears throat> Route 95 128 is part of the interstate highway system. It was built and, and is maintained to carry trucks. 
It is multi-line. It has a breakdown and emergency line specifically designated for that use. It has wide open median strips. It has sound barriers to mitigate the noise situation. It has drainage that's being put in as we sit here now to mitigate any spills and carry anything that goes from spills along the highway and I think along those drinking water supply specific drainages were put in years ago to make sure nothing that was spilled on the roadway got into those reservoirs. What 128 and Route 95 doesn't have is crosswalks. They don't have traffic lights. They don't have pedestrians, thousands of pedestrians or children. They don't have residences, businesses, office buildings within 12 to 15 or 20 feet of the nearest travel lane. They don't have tour buses, segways, bicycles. Uh, there are no historical sites. There, <coughs> excuse me. There are no playgrounds, no ball fields, no swimming pools. 128 and 95 was built for commercial use. Thank you very much. The next three speakers, Stephanie Hogue, Nancy Brennan, and Eva Jean Mintz. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Hogue. I'm the president of the North End Waterfront Residents Association. My address is 7 Henchman Street, apartment 402, Boston. My home is the North End. The North End is a community of approximately 11,000 people living in an area that is a little larger than a quarter of a square mile. To give you some comparison, Somerville, which is the densest city in the state, has a population density less than half that of the North End. So I'm going to ask you to follow me here in a little thought experiment, and I pose this to the people who will ultimately be making the decision about whether or not to accept this rerouting of hazardous material. Let's imagine the accidents that occurred in Everett a couple of years ago and the accident that occurred in Saugus last month occurring in the North End. In Everett, the flammable material flowed down the street and ignited the cars, exploding them. Have you ever tried to park in the North End? Most of our streets are narrow, old city, one-way streets. They are lined with cars. In the accident in Saugus, the flammable, flammable material flowed into a creek. We don't have a creek, but we have highway tunnels, and we have storm sewers that run under the entire North End and drain into the harbor. The affected area from the Saugus accident was approximately one square mile. Superimpose that over the larger, slightly larger than one quarter mile north end, and you have an accident that has obliterated the homes of 11,000 people, and who knows how many people burned or killed, given the tourist density in our neighborhood during the day and even at night. Now picture yourselves in court a couple years after the media circus that would follow that event. And picture yourselves on the witness stand. And exhibit A of the class action attorney is the Battelle study. And you are asked why in the face of federal regulations that require population safety be the primary consideration. You chose to ignore a risk that was four times greater. Thank you, John. Four times greater. Why? Because it was cost effective. Just to give you a little perspective, the last big catastrophe in the North End was 92 years ago, the molasses tank explosion, where 21 people were killed and 150 were injured. The out-of-court settlement for that in today's dollars would be $60 million. Faced with this study and the potential for human life and property damage and the loss of an entire neighborhood, do you still think it would be cost effective? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, 
time, I'm Mr. Secretary. I'm here to testify on behalf of the support of the city's request for a new route. Uh, the Greenway Conservancy uh, manages the Greenway on behalf of the Commonwealth. The parkland now uh, welcomes over a million visitors. But the question in front of you is really the uh, use of this whole area of the city and whether it's appropriate for these truck routes. The elevated expressway that once carried these trucks was taken down to both create the parkland and safer and more attractive surface street conditions, particularly in these densely populated neighborhoods. However, these same streets are the current route of these trucks. The Greenway Conservancy respectfully asks your favorable consideration to alter these truck routes now. And I'll submit the rest of my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Eva Jean Vince. Eva Jean Vince. Eva Jean Vince, I apologize, from 63 to Atlantic Avenue. Exactly. Everybody does that. Um, I would like to support uh, your recommendation. I'd like to commend the city of Boston for observing the obvious and uh, supporting the neighborhood that we all live in. I would like to point out the property values of our neighborhood have risen steadily over the years. We have very high-end hotels, um, several now within feet of my apartment. These, these hotels and the increased property value of the city of Boston will plummet with one accident, with one death, with one maiming with one explosion. There are economics on both sides here. I feel very bad for the truckers. I wish 128 had expanded. Uh, I uh, also wish we had alternative energy and we didn't need these hazardous materials. But life is what it is. I can't believe 128 is more congested than uh, surface road which I traverse on a regular basis, going much slower than five miles an hour. So I hope that you'll uh, stick to your guns here, continue to do what was obviously right from the very beginning, and I congratulate you. Thank you. The next three speakers are as follows, Joanne Trigos and Zalone. Paul Foster and Amy Jones. Hi, I'm Joanne Prevo Anzalone. I'm representing the North End business community. And we have been meeting now for a couple of years on this issue. And the one thing I heard here tonight, which I never heard at any of our meetings, was cost. Cost was something we never discussed because as far as I'm concerned, it's not an issue. Safety is the issue. We fully support all the speakers who have come up so far to give their approval to the proposal that's been submitted tonight. We want this to happen. It should happen. It's the fair thing. But the bottom line is, I'd just like to ask one question. How many here in this room support this proposal? So you can see, overwhelmingly, in this room, it's supported, and I hope you will, too. Thank you. Paul Foster, 540 Commercial Street. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the city for the diligence in this matter. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to make one point, and uh, that's regarding the TD Garden. Uh, I don't know if anybody has mentioned that, but we do have about 1,360,000 people that attend that facility in the course of a year. So I'd be very grateful if you'd make a note of that. Amy Jabba's at 87 River Street in Cambridge. Hi, Mr. Chairman and Secretary. Um, I'm here to testify in support represent the potential flooding outward if in any 
either alternative happens. Um, living, we just recently relocated to River Street in Cambridge, which um, during the daytime I can understand lots of traffic and trucks moving through um, to get commerce through, but I didn't realize there was a late, late night uh, barreling of many um, hazardous trucks coming through already. And I'm concerned, one, which I'm already in conversation with Cambridge Department of Transportation to try to address some of that, but um, the potential for people to find alternative routes. So what I'm not hearing in any of this meeting is how um, some of that will be regulated. How will the cutoffs or changes be addressed if, if there are going to be alternatives? Thank you. The next three speakers, jo Joanne Hayes Rines, Craig Fossa, and Matt Conti. My name is Joanne Hayes Rhines, and I am a resident of Harbor Towers since 1996. And these are two towers on the waterfront in Boston that house approximately 1,200 people. I, I think it's pretty obvious to everybody that really nobody wants these trucks. But when you have uh, federal guidelines that have established 13 criteria to determine what is the safest route, and that the route through our neighborhood, and that's truly what it is, is a neighborhood. Uh, the, we bring in thousands of tourists every year, but we have such a community of people. No neighborhood in America would want these trucks. And our roads are very tight, as everyone has said. One thing I think no, no one has said is, we've had a lot of development, the Greenway is fabulous, it's attracting more and more people, but that's not going to stop. There's more and more development that's going to happen. We'll have more condos, not fewer. We'll have more traffic, not less. We'll have more people on the Greenway and in the North End, not less. The study looked at today's evidence and said four times more dangerous. In five years, it could be six times more dangerous. But you have to look at today's numbers, and based on that, I don't see how you have any decision to make but to say, unfortunately for the truckers, it has, they have to go around 128. Thank you very much. Everybody, my name is Craig Foss. I live at 30 Iroquois Street on Mission Hill in Roxbury Cross in Massachusetts. I'm here tonight at this public hearing to say that all hazardous trucks should be banned on the street of Boston because it poses a public risk. People get killed and people and it and, and safety is number one important, just like everyone in this room. And I've taken Amtrak on day trips to New York City, Sea Coast, New Hampshire, and Maine lots of times. And I've taken Amtrak to Washington, D.C. lots of times. And I've come back to North Station or South Station. I've been under the big, big tunnels. And frankly, it's the big, big tunnels scare me because a, five years ago, a Jamaican flame woman was killed. So if I come back, if I, if I come back from New York, or Washington, D.C., or, in, or anywhere across the country, or maybe I would take the city streets, or, because the construction company who did construction work on the big dig should be held morally and legally responsible, and they should pay steeper fines, and they should, they should pay for the cost, not the taxpayers. I hope you will support this proposal to ban hazmat trucks on the city streets and to, and, to, um, and to make the construction company who who is constructing the big state, pay heavy fines and pay for the cost, not the taxpayers. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Matt Donkey of NorthEndWaterfront.com. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I am a member of the North End Waterfront Hazmat Task Force, an informal group of residents and business owners that have been working on this issue uh, for Quite a, quite a long time. I'm also the editor of NorthEndWaterfront.com. And I, most importantly, I'm a resident of Commercial Street. My building is approximately 12 feet from a designated route in Boston. And yes, we do live in fear. I'm here tonight to simply ask the state officials to take the actions spelled out by the federal routing criteria. You have the data. There's 182 pages of it. 
I speak in strong support of the City of Boston's proposal. Because the routes through Boston present more than a 50% greater risk than using Route 128, the highway route should become the designated hazmat route, quote, regardless of length and circuitry. That is the federal routing criteria. Routes through Boston, including the North End and Waterfront, quote, demonstrate significantly increased risk by hazmat cargoes. There is ample justification to restrict hazmat shipments through downtown Boston. Nothing in the report, and I will uh, quote from what Patel said, restricts the local delivery of gasoline, diesel fuel, and fuel oil within the city of Boston. The analysis actually goes further, and this is a point that was not brought up by Patel uh, in their statement, but is in their report, that because there are uncertainties in any risk assessment, it's an, quote, an analysis of an analysis, there's no, quote, reasonable change in the route parameters that would change the routing conclusions. The conclusions are extremely strong especially for daytime routing with four times a risk ratio. That's four times the risk of using downtown Boston versus the highways and 128. As close as you can get to be 100% confidence level from a statistical basis. Even at night, the risk ratio is a 95% confidence level. The risk ratio is 2.2 times the risk. Any reasonable estimate would keep the nighttime risk ratio above 1.5 times. That is the federal <coughs> routing criteria, uh, thus well above what is required uh, for you to do in your decision. The, in terms of the unwritten, there was also an un unreasonable burden analysis in the report. And as some of the elected officials said, the increase in operating costs is estimated to be $162 a day for a hazmat truck. And I believe that's for 10 round trips during the day for one truck. That equates to less than 0.1 cents per gallon if applied to the residents around Route 128. And it's probably less than that. The costs are in, in negligible and certainly uh, insignificant. The cost and economic factors don't even come into play here. So I hope you won't be fooled by that smoke and mirrors. Uh, also, you know, this is a public safety no-brainer. You know, the North End Waterfront Hazmat Task Force was pleased to have submitted not just the quantitative uh, input and as well as the subjective data that many of my neighbors have already stated, and I won't repeat again. Uh, we implore MassDOT as a state's routing agency to redesignate the hazmat truck route for through vehicles off of our city neighborhood streets and out of one of the densest areas uh, of the state and not the country to the much safer highways around Boston. Thank you. The next three speakers will be Richard Domino, Donna Freddy, and Sandra Harcourt. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and panel, as well as Secretary Mullen, Commissioner Timlin, for your comments earlier. My name is Richard Tomino. I'm the President and CEO of A Better City, and I'm speaking on behalf of our organization in full support of the City of Boston's proposed routing uh, for trucks carrying hazardous materials. We believe the hazmat route evaluation prepared while the City of Boston by Patel Memorial Institute clearly demonstrates that the safety risks associated with routing hazards, hazmat deliveries through downtown Boston is far greater than for routes that circumvent the city via Route 128 or other highways. A better city is a business association. We represent Greater Boston's business and institutional communities. Our matters that relate to transportation, land development, and the environment. If you will, we represent the major economic drivers of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. <coughs> This summer, we have seen continuing flourishing activity and population growth in the financial district and the Greenway as a destination for residents, workers, and tourists alike. New food trucks, a new bicycle program, and the opening of the High Rhino Pavilions have all served to help activate the Greenway Carter. This has increased pedestrian and bicycle traffic in the very surface roads currently being used to transport hazardous materials through the cities. These routes are also lined with major commercial residential cultural properties, the latter of which are among Boston's most popular tourist attractions. Finally, the routes are in close proximity to the MBTA facilities, North Station, South Station, are directly above the Central Artery, and numerous underground utilities. These are all serious safety issues that we need to be concerned with 
and that's why we're supporting the City of Boston's proposal. Given the significant higher accident rate on surface streets compared to highways as documented by the Tower Report, and given the catastrophic consequences of an incident in downtown Boston, we strongly support the City of Boston's proposed 24-hour ban on hazmat streets, uh, hazmat through trips on city streets. We believe the city's report clearly shows the increased risk of permit, permitting hazardous through routes on Boston streets and more than justifies prohibiting such routing. I also want to state that this isn't uh, um, a Boston versus the rest of the state issue. This is a state issue. This is about regional safety. This is about regional infrastructure and it's about a statewide population. The city of Boston's population doubles every day. Those are citizens that come from every Commonwealth, corner of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that we potentially put at risk because they're employees of my organization. We can't really seriously consider putting additional risk and burden on those lives. So this, if, if this discussion does end up becoming the, a, a suburban versus Boston discussion, I hope that we remember where the workforce comes from and where those people live. All people throughout the Commonwealth are put at greater risk by having these hazardous materials come through the city of Boston streets. Finally, as the former Transportation Commissioner of the City of Boston, I just want to make note that while I was involved with the preliminary design and environmental permitting of the Central Area Tunnel Project, the City of Boston and the Fire Commissioner said that hazardous materials should not go through the Central Area uh, portion of the Central Area Tunnel Project and the tunnels because of the related risks. That risk has only grown. So I hope that you would support the City of Boston and its proposal to uh, eliminate has hazmat materials through the City of Boston streets. Thank you for the time. John Freddy, President of the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Donna Freddy. I'm a resident of 85 East India Row, also known as Harbor Towers. And I'm also president of the North End Waterfront Neighborhood Council, which is formerly known as NUNIC. NUNIC, as you may be aware, is an elected body. And we represent the North End Waterfront Neighborhood and serve as an advisory board to the City of Boston. NUNIC has spent a considerable amount of time discussing this issue of hazmat trucks. And we firmly believe that protecting our neighborhoods and the safety of its residents is of utmost importance. NUNIC, NUNIC therefore, strongly supports the proposed routing designation that would uh, prohibit the pass-through of hazardous material trucks through uh, the city of Boston, and most importantly, through the neighborhood that we care so much about. We have already seen a tragedy in the city of Saugus, right nearby, and many people have already spoken to that issue. And recently, we had a close call with an oil spillage uh, right near Harbor Towers and near the Greenway. You've heard someone speak from Harbor Towers, and you've heard Nancy Brennan speak from the Greenway. All it would have taken is a match or a cigarette thrown on that oil spillage that was there, and we could have had potential hazard with, as Joanne haynes Ryan said, as a resident of Harbor Towers, 1,200 residents at risk, and all the hotels and other areas around there, never mind all the money in, that has been invested in, in beautifying our si city with the green light. That would have all gone up in flames. We don't want that kind of a tragedy to happen. It is clear that hazmat trucks put our neighborhoods at risk, and we respect, respectfully ask that Mass Dot support the findings of the comprehensive study, which proposes a ban of pass-through hazmat trucks in our densely populated, <coughs> populated North End Waterfront neighborhood. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the neighborhood that we serve. Unit strongly urges you to follow the city's um, support of this ban. Thank you very much. like you, DOT, Mass DOT, to support the recommendation of the city. I think, when I think about infrastructure, I've lived in 23 cities throughout the world in the United States, and when I think of infrastructure and what's available to us, while some of it may not be ideal and we're challenged with how we overcome this, I think it's really important we ought to think about our putting our energy and efforts into making the infrastructure outside of the city correct that enables the business to support the, the carrying of the materials outside the city. The conditions, again, are not ideal. The weather is not ideal. However, I think many people tonight here, and there are many that are not here that I know have written emails and letters to you that are quite concerned 
it is, a, to me, an obvious conclusion as a concerned citizen, and I trust that you will make the right decision and support the city's recommendation to reroute the materials. Thank you for the opportunity. Up next are Virginia Campbell, Michelle Brogan, and Elizabeth Phillips. My name is Michelle Brogan. I'm a resident of 300 Commercial Street, which is right on the waterfront and directly along the route that we're talking about here. I just want to re enforce uh, the statements that I've heard this evening which have been very insightful. Anyone who walks down those streets, particularly at this time of the year, can see what a disaster it would be, let alone the idea of being in the tunnels with one of those hazmat trucks. There's no ideal way of handling this situation. Somebody's going to have to suffer. But in the long run, the idea of being on an open highway where at least you can get trucks to you, as opposed to being trapped in a tunnel or on a small neighborhood street, I just don't see how there can be any issue. Thank you very much, and I hope that we will be able to get this going. Michelle Brogan of 300 Commercial Street. That was my fault. Hi, I'm Virginia Kimball. I live at 130 Fulton Street in the North End. And again, I'm just a citizen who wants to support the proposal. I walk the streets with my dog all the time, day and night. And I will say at night, those trucks are going much faster than 8 to 10 miles an hour. I, you know, I've heard that several times, but they might pause you know at night for the stop signs they didn't they don't stop they, they're making up their you know I just really am opposed to having them there day or night okay. Elizabeth Phillips from 50 Battery Street I'm Elizabeth Phillips I'm a Boston citizen voter taxpayer home oil user <laughs> gasoline user and I support the proposal to reroute the hazmat trucks away from the residential streets, away from the places where tourists gather, away from the hotels, away from the aquarium, away from the greenway, away from where everybody's having fun in the sun and enjoying the city of Boston. <coughs> I'm sorry it takes you longer to go around 128, but I think you should take the time to do it. Thank you very much. And the last video is Mimi LaCamera from the Freedom Trail Foundation, 99 Chauncey Street. Between you and going home. I'll <laughs> 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 be really short. Hi, I'm Mimi LaCamera. I'm president of the Freedom Trail Foundation, uh, the marketing organization that, that provides uh, support and also marketing for the Freedom Trail. The, the routes that go through the city with the trucks are go on the Freedom Trail in the North End. But I wanted to speak, first of all, I'm a, I'm a resident of Back Bay on Beacon Street where we have wonderful restrictions on trucks in Back Bay. So if it can happen in Back Bay, it can happen in the North End. There are 22 million people who visit Boston every year. Uh, there are three, uh, one, uh, 3 million people who walk on the Freedom Trail. We alone take care of 80,000 people as we escort people along the Freedom Trail. It is a billion dollar business in Boston that generates 160,000 jobs in Massachusetts tourism does. I think anything that will keep those tourists safe on the streets in Boston will be good for the city and good for everyone's pocket. And I would like to support uh, rerouting the tra trucks outside of the city so that we can take care of the golden goose in Boston. Thank you. Uh, we just had two more uh, individuals sign up to speak. And the next one will be Amanda Hamill from 91 Clark Street in Lynn. Amanda, I am not from Boston. I am Lynn, but I just wanted to uh, state my opinion today. I thought it would be a great opportunity to speak. 
Um, can anyone in this room tell me um, the number one rollover situation? Where does that happen? Can anyone tell me? Ramps. Ramps. No, no, ramps. No, ramps. Can anyone try again? Um, excuse me. Time. It's a this is not a, it's not a question and answer. You are testifying she, to the she, board. She, so you need to I'm, testify. I'm well, well I, can, I can tell you that Thank the number one um, rollover for a truck is on straightaways, um, and that's the truth. Uh, 128 um, is a major hazard. I know it's going around and everyone talks about safety, but this is safety. Um, it's roll, trucks aren't going to roll over doing 8 to 10 miles an hour going through Boston City. I know it's ugly, and I agree with you, it's very ugly seeing a, a tanker going down the street at the... Uh, the greenway and the waterfront, and I know many of you are, um, you know, concerning your opinion. I, I respect that, but um, just keep in mind that rollovers don't happen going around a turn, or going around a turn, going four miles an hour. And you're right. I've heard people say that there are no bicycles and no segways and no pedestrians on 128 and no crosswalks and no lights. That's completely true, I agree with you. I don't see that on 128, but what I do see on 128 has had rollovers because drivers get complacent. They go on a straight road and they get fatigued. And there are DOT um, uh, hours of service to drive, but the drivers are fatigued and they get complacent with the road, like 128.95 and they get used to driving that same road. They need stoplights, they need crosswalks, they need mm -hmm. pedestrians. Not saying that they're going to hurt any of you, but I mean, these are things that are keeping the driver aware and alert, not going on an on ramp or traveling 40 miles on one strip of lane. Thank you. Kathy Colano Ray. Uh, resident of Harbor Towers. Hi, as you heard, I'm a resident of Harbor Towers, but I just want to say I support the um, proposal. But in addition, I want to tell you a personal story because my family was impacted by the Saugus um, rollover. And here, a whole neighborhood of within a mile was put in danger, in flame. And the houses were not 12 feet like they are from Matt Conti's. But we are very, very close. And if an, an accident like that happened, it would be a horrific thing for everyone. But in addition, what everyone forgot is how many days Route 1 was closed down because of that accident. Imagine this happening in our city with the density of the population of the residents and the work people could come. If we had an accident like that, the city would be shut down for days and days and days. My family, who live on Lindfels Parkway, could not drive on the street because the traffic was rerouted. They had an alternative. I could not see my elderly parents for days because I could not reach them. Now, you people here, I understand there is a problem with the truckers and people going on a major highway and it would impact a lot of people. But we're talking about people's safety and a city that operates with people coming in from the suburbs to work. And if we had an accident like that happened in Saugus, we would be in real, real trouble. And it would be a horrific thing. Thank you. Samantha Popovitz from 91 Clock Street in Lynn. Grew up in the trucking industry. My family runs and owns JNS Transport. Um, everyone's major concern is safety. And this is basically about the facts right now. Um, I heard that Boston hasn't had a major accident in 92 years. When was the last major accident that has happened? It was a month ago on a major highway. It Just look at the facts. The fact that our drivers and the dri other drivers of other companies know what they're doing. They know how to drive. And it's, it's proven by seeing them that they're driving through Boston. And it hasn't happened in 92 years. 
but being on a highway where you've got cars that are unpredictable. Like, like this past one that's happened a month ago. No one knows exactly what happened. There could have been a car that came down the opposite side of the road, a car that cut that up, a driver off. Something happened that night that it created that driver to lose his life by forcing our drivers and other drivers to go around and be on 128, Route 1, 95, those straightaways, those highways going at high speeds with other unpredictable three lanes of cars, you are almost guaranteeing there to be a ha an accident every other month. At, uh, just look at the statistics. One month ago, it was a major accident. 92 years ago in Boston, a major accident. Thank you. Mr. Roberts, that concludes the public testimony portion of the hearing. Uh, Prior to closing, I'd like to I'd like to recognize some uh, officials from the city of Boston that have taken the time to, to spend uh, the entire evening with us tonight. Uh, Boston Fire Marshal Frank Cotsis, Boston Police Deputy Supervisor Bill Evans, Director of Emergency Preparedness Don Mago, uh, BTD Deputy Commissioner Jim Gillooly, Corporation Counsel Attorney Henry Luthen, and Outside Counsel Charles Dyer. And on a personal note. I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight and giving testimony, and most of all, since this is such a passionate issue for so many, I'd like to thank you all for showing everybody the respect and letting them give, give their testimony uninterrupted. Uh, I, I'm very hopeful that the rest of the hearings will go as well as the night did. Uh, and just as a reminder, the next hearing is tomorrow night at Quincy, Thomas Crane Public Library, 400 Washington Street, from 6.30 to 8.30. With that, uh, that will conclude the, the formal hearing for the, this evening. And I did forget to mention this at the beginning, but we do have a stenographer here taking testimony and recording all the, all the testimony that happened this evening so that we can prepare our, our responses to our website. Thank you. <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a little.